Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you to the American University School of International Service and Kate Arian, our Assistant Director of Events at SIS for organizing this event. Thank you to all of you who are taking the time to virtually join us for this discussion. And of course, thank you to Dr. Sandra Fahi for taking the time to speak with us about her book, Dying for Rights, <clears throat> Putting North Korea's Human Rights Abuses on the Record. This discussion will last for about 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Answers to questions will not be typed into the Q&A function, but the closed captions will include all responses. We ask that no one record this session. We will be recording the webinar and it'll be available on the SIS YouTube channel for those who would like to watch it again or for anyone who may have missed the event. Now, uh, before I forget to introduce myself, I am Jeff Bachman, a senior professorial lecturer at the School of International Service and chair of the Ethics, Peace and Human Rights MA program. Because I'm the farthest thing from an expert on North Korea and because I have many questions for Dr. Fahi, I think it'd be best if we get right into it. But first I wanna offer a more formal introduction to our esteemed guest. Sandra Fahi is an associate professor of anthropology in the Faculty of Global Arts and the graduate program in global studies at Sofia University, Tokyo. She's the author of two books about human rights in North Korea. She was a visiting fellow with the, with the human rights program at Harvard Law School, where, she's, where she was working on a book about state perpetrators who use audiovisual technology to deny viola rights violations. And she holds a PhD from SOAS University of London. Sandra, it is good to have you with us. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Um, so before we get deeper into the content of Dying for Human Rights, I want to ask you about something from your introduction. You write that there are, quote, countless issues related to personality, gender, age, and the positionality of myself as a white, Korean-speaking, UK-educated woman. Can you describe some of these issues and their impacts on your research? Um, okay, well, first of all, I'd love to thank you for inviting me, Jeff. It's a pleasure to meet you and Kate, Aaron, um, Arian, excuse me, and the captioner um, for making this closed caption. I'm, I'm very grateful for all of you and the uh, people who are attending. You know, in anthropology, we talk a lot about how our positionality impacts the type of questions we ask and the types of answers that we might get. Um, I'll just give you one example. Um, you know, a lot of times when I was working with North Koreans, I, I lived in South Korea from 2001 to 2004 before I ever started my PhD. And then um, of course went to London to do my PhD. And then throughout the time of my field work was back in South Korea, living there. So for in total about five years, I was in South Korea. And many times when I was working with North Korean defectors, they would say to me like, Uri like we're not South Korean, you know, us foreigners and or us outsiders. Um, so North Koreans, I think, felt more comfortable telling me things that they didn't necessarily feel comfortable telling South Koreans. And of course, just in the same way, you know, South Korean researchers who work on North Korea will have privileged access to information and insights that, that I don't have access to because of my positionality. So that kind of standpoint epistemology that maybe philosophers would speak about, anthropo anthropologists are also sympathetic to, you know, my own positionality. So um, if I have a disability or the fact that I'm white or the fact that, you know, I was born in, in, in Dublin, Ireland, a country that uh, is divided, a country that uh, was impacted by famine, a country that uh, was, you know, underwent uh, colonialism, a country that is post-colonial. And so these were aspects that I evoked when I spoke to North Koreans, not only about famine, but about uh, the colonial experience, post-coloniality and uh, things like that. So um, it was a way of uh, bonding and connecting, uh, but it also, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of living abroad, but you know, sometimes, um, people might feel more comfortable telling outsiders things that they wouldn't necessarily tell their most clo closest kinfolk, you know? Thank you, Sandra. Um, and you started uh, making a segue to your book. You mentioned, um, you know, the colonial legacy, uh, but for those less familiar with Korean history, can you briefly offer our listeners an overview of the history to help contextualize your research? So in this book, I tried to give you know, I tried to give the reader everything I could and the editor, 
Kaylin Cobb, who's my editor at Columbia University Press, is an incredible young editor, and she cut out about 10,000, maybe 15,000 words. So there was a lot that had to be cut out of the book. I wanted to provide as much historical context as possible, uh, but then, you know, having to fulfill the remit of covering all of North Korea's human rights issues domestically and internationally, it was quite difficult to really capture the full scope of the human, um, the history in terms of how history has shaped the human rights situation in North Korea. So historians out there that wish to cover this topic more specifically, um, my hat's off to them and, and I hope that they will do that. But, um, you know, I guess the first question students might ask is why is the human rights situation so different between North and South Korea? And uh, how is it that uh, a line arbitrarily drawn uh, in, you know, on the land uh, shapes human rights so differently north and south of the 38th parallel. For instance, the famine that happened in the 1990s um, and the types of situations that are ongoing since the foundation of the country to the present. So the first thing that I would point to is coloniality, the Japanese coming in and occupying Korea in 1910. Um, and like you see with most colonial states, I mean, I'm not an expert on coloniality, but when you look at post-colonial states, um, there are, the populations have lots of different ideas about how the country should then be run, how the country should be governed, what kind of politics, how to respond to the colonial, traumatic colonial experience. And you can see that in the country I'm in right now in, in Galway, I'm sitting in Ireland, and how Ireland, North and South have responded. Um, North and South Korea have responded in very different ways to their coloniality. Um, at the defeat of the Japanese in 45, the Soviets occupied the North, the Americans occupied the South, and then, um, you know, the North was founded in 48, and the South uh, then, and then also you have the issue of uh, the Korean War started in 1950. Some people debate that North Korea started the war, but the evidence is there that they did, and tried to occupy all of South Korea, and then they were fought back. Um, you know, this was a this was a civil war. This was a, a father fatherland liberation war, as it's called in North Korea. Uh, the Korean War, as it's called in the South. Um, I sometimes say it's a it was a war for unification by the North of the South to completely unify the country under a North Korean system. Um, you know, and the different types of politics you see North and South, uh, as I argue in the book. Uh, shape the types of entitlements to human rights that you see in the country. So perhaps we can dig a little bit deeper and I can explain a little bit more about the history of um, how human rights have evolved on both sides of um, the 38th parallel since the founding of both countries. Sure, thank you. And um, I can imagine, uh, I mean, the, the book is so packed with information. Um, I would like, I'd be interested to see what these 10 to 15,000 words that were cut out had to say. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's a whole another couple of chapters, I suppose. Um, you know, in, in your research, you did employ various methods, um, you know, in the conduct of your research. Can you, you briefly describe these uh, these methods and, and any challenges that you were confronted with? So for me, uh, when I'm doing research, I like to be as comprehensive as possible. That's one of the wonderful privileges of being a professor and having all the time that we do have and the access to resources that we do have and research assistance and so on. And, and actually at this point, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Sophia University who um, nominated me for two faculty awards during the time that gave me research that research funds that would have been you know, given to more of the faculty, but they elected me. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, I um, gathered every single piece of information I could um, not only from, you know, uh, open source materials, but I also found um, gray literature. Um, otherwise, the question of reliability is there, but leaked material from North Korea uh, that I was able to get access to in North Korea. I mean, pardon me, in Japan, pardon me, from a bookseller that, that bought it from North Koreans who went into China. Um, all of the UN's material, um, the uh, over 200 testimonies of, uh, that were collected by the United Nations, uh, all of North Korea's own documents that they have produced about their human rights situation. Uh, I also hired a um, computational social scientist to web scrape all of North Korea's media for me so that I could do an analysis of how they speak about human rights in their own media. In particular, uh, I paid emphasis to 
uh, since the publication of the United Nations report in 2014. So I did a kind of computational analysis of about 17,000 North Korean newspaper articles as well. And I also did analysis of their own videos. So whatever I could get my hands on, I examined and I examined it very carefully. Um, as you can see, the book is packed with information. The font is very small. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but I hope people read it because uh, I tried very hard. And if there are challenges uh, to be raised against the book, I, I hope people will do so in, in publication. Um, and the book is meant to be a testament, a kind of, as I describe it in the book, a kind of gravestone to those people who are unable to speak um, or speak on behalf of um, those family members who are who have suffered or lost their lives as a result of the human rights that I covered. Thank you, Sandra. And you know, for our students that are interested in in, in methodology, was um, was this the first time as an anthropologist? I'm not sure how typical working with discourse analysis is. Was that um, a new approach for you? So. During my PhD work, I did uh, a lot of interviewing. And of course, with that, you pay a lot of attention to discourse analysis. Critical discourse analysis always recognizes that when you're any mode of communication always involves power. So how is power being operated and wielded? So for instance, in my first book, I paid very close attention to, well, I elicited how North Koreans used humor uh, during the famine time, because I knew that humor, despite being during a very dark period um, would, would appear. And I knew that because um, previously I'd studied at Yad Vashem in, um, in Israel and uh, had studied Holocaust testimony in the presence of kind of quote gulag's humor. Um, you know, uh, Tadzio Borowski's book, This Way to the Gas, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen, you know. Um, so I was aware that um, asking provocative questions, for instance, could lead to very provocative insights. So as the example, I will just follow it. I asked North Koreans about, you know, do you remember any, any humor from the time of the famine? And uh, while most people would think of that as a kind of repugnant question to ask a famine survivor, uh, most of them said, you know, actually, no, I don't. And, but then they would say, oh yeah, actually I do, I do remember. Like there were jokes like, um, you know, the security police eat securely and the, um, uh, the secret police eat secretly, you know, and the party workers eat like they're having a party, this type of thing. So this course analysis, critical discourse analysis can provide a lot of insights into class dynamics, power dynamics, and how people respond to those. So that's just one example. But uh, in this book, I did an analysis of how the oral testimonies were interpreted and engaged with at the United Nations. So for instance, there were missed opportunities. Um, people at the United Nations were working with translators, obviously. I paid attention to when, for instance, translators themselves became so emotionally caught up in what was being shared um, that they began to cry, choke up, couldn't speak. You know, all of these things are, are very telling. Um, you know, sometimes, for instance, the interlocutors, the North Koreans were kind of unable to understand, comprehend the types of questions that were being asked at them. So for instance, you know, if you knew the types of things that you were reporting weren't necessarily true, why did you report them? And then, you know, the, the answers were sort of these cognitive loopholes, almost like a kind of Mobius strip, you know, it sort of seems three dimensional, but it's actually just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or a kind of Klein bottle, it sort of undoes itself, excuse me, undoes itself, you know? Um, they would say, well, you know, that's just the way it was, or we could, I mean, there are many examples in the book, I can't even remember all of them now, um, which is why I think people write books, so they don't have to remember everything that they're putting down, but um, yeah, I hope that sort of answers that a little bit. I, yeah. It does, it does, and it reminded me a little bit of um, you know, some of this other research that I've been reading uh, on transitional justice in uh, Argentina and, and Guatemala, and, and some of the I mean, I guess it's obvious that there's going to be emotion involved in, in the testimonies, but just how powerful um, that unleashing of emotion is, especially when maybe they haven't had the chance to um, voice or express those emotions to, um, say, a third party, like you said, someone um, from the outside. So, um, yeah, so that, that does bring up, um, you know, some of the uh, questions I had about, you know, testimonies. And, you um, I guess, you know, you've already addressed this a little bit, but why are firsthand accounts and testimonies so important um, for human rights monitoring, um, but especially in North Korea? And, and where is this information limited? So for me, I've always 
been drawn to oral histories and oral accounts and the way survivors tell about the inner mechanism, meaning really the inner mechanism, how totalitarianism, for instance, manifests inside the survivor at the moment that it's happening and then in the collective, in the camp, for instance. This is all very fascinating to me. You get an extra level of appreciation, you know, the internal is made external through those accounts. Um, it's very powerful. As you said, you know, um, you think of like the Truth and Reconciliation Tribunals in South Africa, you know, the women kind of felt reluctant to share certain things because the audience that was present. And this kind of goes back to the first question that you asked me, how does my own positionality shape, you know, what I learn, what I hear, what I'm able to hear. Um, yeah, uh, the interesting thing with North Korea, let me see, what's the best way to say this? Um, and it applies to other places as well, of course, but um, in North Korea, quite unlike a lot of places, we don't have access. And access is kind of the penultimate aspect that has to continually be pushed um, at the United Nations, at governments, people listening, I would encourage you to push your own governments, um, NGOs, um, to, to get access to ordinary North Korean people on the ground. Um, because we don't have that, really, um, we don't have access without the control of North Korea, uh, the North Korean government in the country. Um, because of that, we are compelled to speak with North Korean defectors. And the issue there then is that North Korea critiques these individuals. And according to North Korean law, these people are, these people have violated North Korean national security laws. They have defected from the country um, and by default are traitors to the country. And um, they are, um, you know, money obsessed. They are telling lies about the country um, and they're telling lies to make money. And um, they're being you know, paid by the CIA, they're being paid by National Endowment for Democracy or whatever it is that alleged um, to make up stories about North Korea. So what North Korea says is come to our country, see what we have to say. Of course, I've applied to get into North Korea. I was denied even though I have an Irish passport. I should have been, I could have been uh, given access, but. North Korea's own human rights organization says, you know, you're more than welcome, Jack, you yourself are more than welcome to come into the country and do research, but you have to abide by North Korea's concept of human rights, like uh, our style human rights. Um, so uh, I'm kind of losing my train of thought a little bit there, but uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's 10 p.m. here, now 10.30. <laughs> Can you help me out a little bit? Yeah, sure. Do you, is there, are there, a couple of stories, uh, specific stories that you can, um, that you want to share, uh, and maybe also ways the North Korean government tried to discredit those stories? So, well, let me just say this thing, first of all, which is that many people will say, and, and some academics have written about this. Um, I don't quite agree. If you look closely at what some, uh, some people have written, um, it's, you know, there's a few individuals that have come forward with um, stories that have uh, inaccuracies, that have um, perhaps been um, not completely accurate. Um, some details maybe have been omitted. Um, for instance, Young Mi, Young Mi Park is uh, accused of having omitted certain parts of her testimony when she gave her account it at, um, I believe she was speaking in Dublin actually. Um, but it's, it's just not possible that you could have currently in South Korea, I believe there are about 32,000 North Korean defectors and every single one of them to have status in North Korea needs to pass through um, Hanawon Center in addition to before Hanawon Center, another kind of interrogation facility. And their information is um, gathered and researched very carefully in South Korea. Um, and then in addition, you have uh, more than 100,000 North Koreans uh, settled illegally in China, whether settled or crossing back and forth. And in the United Kingdom and Canada, the United States now, and other countries, we have more and more North Korean defectors. I think Japan has about 200. It's, it's simply not possible that all of these individuals could be involved in the same conspiratorial lie, that North Korea is fine, for instance, 
and that these people are all just lying and saying that concentration camps exist and there's a system of Songbun and it's just not possible that that number of people could kind of consolidate and organize their lives that well, particularly when you have a population which is extremely disenfranchised, uh, only usually has access to Korean as their primary language. And in particular, uh, currently in Moon Jae-in's administration in South Korea, it's quite hostile to North Korean defectors and highly sympathetic to North Korea. So just on that point alone, uh, it's just not possible that they could be uh, making things up. Um, I mean, you know, in any person's given person's story, what's fascinating to me is that you find that um, and this was quite surprising to me when I when I did the research for my first book and interviewed North Korean defectors, that even though they lived through the famine in North Korea, the 1990s, you know, when you do research, you have all kinds of assumptions, right? And hopefully you have a loose association with those assumptions. It's like you're quite happy to, well, maybe not happy, but you're you're willing to set those aside. You're willing to be proved wrong, even as an expert, like especially as an anthropologist we sometimes ask questions that we already know the answers to, or that we, we know are naive in, in the hopes of evoking certain answers from our interlocutors that are gonna tell us even more than we might expect. So for instance, I would say things like, well, how did North Korea advertise the famine? How did they let you know that the famine was happening so that you could prepare? Of course, I knew that North Korea didn't advertise the famine, right? So then people were able to say to me, well, we, you know, I just saw my, I knew that there was something wrong because my teacher started falling asleep at her desk and the, the teachers were telling us to go out and, and collect certain resources that we could then bring back and that could be, you know, sold in the market and so on and so forth. So and different types of things like that could be very insightful. Um, the other thing that was quite interesting is that I found that most of these people I spoke to were quite reluctant to leave North Korea, and there was often a breaking point at which they left. Another thing that was surprising was that North Koreans didn't see the government as responsible for the famine at all. Um, and this relates to the issue, uh, which I talk about in this book, about structural human rights violations that take on a socioeconomic visage, as opposed to um, you know, physical integrity human rights violations like torture or rape or forced abortion or you know, arbitrary imprisonment. Those types of human rights violations are often experienced and interpreted in a very different sort of way. So for instance, North Koreans often, uh, a few North Koreans I spoke to said to me, oh, well, I knew then at that moment when I saw in that uh, field that uh, a farmer had gone in, a person had gone in and stolen two potatoes and was shot, that he was shot in exchange for that. That's when I knew my relationship to that place changed. Not necessarily the relationship to the government. Their interpretation of the government hadn't changed, but their belief that they could continue to remain in that place changed. And then they knew that they had to make a kind of, the price was the same, they said, if I leave or if I stay. And it was at that point, at that kind of calculus that they decided to leave. Thank you. And you, you started touching on uh, <clears throat> socioeconomic rights, political rights and physical integrity rights violations. Um, could you tell the audience a little bit about why people with disabilities uh, are especially at risk of human rights violations in North Korea? So there's a very interesting young man that's, uh, I think, just been elected to a political office in South Korea. Um, uh, Ji Sung Ho, I believe is his name. I write about him in the book. Um, he suffered an incredible injury in North Korea when he was trying to steal coal from a train and he fell off and he was run over by the train, lost his arm and leg, in, and he was 13 years old at the time. And he talks about how, you know, in North Korea, it, it was just par for the course that you would kind of make fun of someone who was disabled or you would, um, someone that was visibly physically disabled, that you would just um, kind, of, kind of make a name that was associated with their injury and the whole family would be known by that name, the family of such and such injury, you know, identified completely by that. Um, Ji Sung Ho talks about his own experience of going to China um, on the um, crutches that his father made him. And some of you might have seen um, Trump then kind of operationalized this young man's experience for his own speech. And uh, Ji Sung Ho held up his crutches that he basically walked out of North Korea on. 
um, during Trump's speech, but and we can bring that up later if you'd like. Um, but when the uh, North Korean uh, secret police caught him and brought him back to North Korea and they were beating him and abusing him, um, they beat and abused him in a particular way that was about his disability. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know that North Korea has set up Pyongyang as a sort of model city. I mean, some people even call it a kind of city state like uh, Pyonghattan, like it's a special kind of territorial zone, which is in fact the case. Um, you know, pe the disabled people are absented from that space. What's interesting is that U the UN representative for, di for disability rights in North Korea noted, um, even though North Korea was trying to make things look as if there wasn't a problem, through the absence of people who are disabled, uh, she was able to note that there was a problem. So not seeing the representation of people who are disabled, um, not seeing access in buildings which were built, you know, 2017, 2018, there's no excuse. Why is this happening? Um, you know, um, she was able to, to level a, a critique about that. And so for instance, even if you think of cases like Down syndrome, in Down syndrome, you will find a certain percentage of individuals born with Down syndrome in any country um, but in the case of North Korea, North Korea kind of pathologizes its own presence of disability as if it's a sign that they themselves are failing, when in fact it's, it's not. And so um, the disability can be embraced as a form of being, that we can be different and equal. This is something that's quite untenable in, in North Korea. And so for that reason, I think those with disabilities are especially vulnerable in North Korea. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sort of walk us back a little. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit out first about the history. Um, and, you know, I, I guess the, the question is, how is North Korea's present in, entangled with its past? And it's also important to avoid getting overly stuck on the past when considering the human rights violations and the way it treats its own population today. So this is an interesting thing because, um, if you read North Korea's own human rights report, which I cite in, in the book uh, quite extensively, there are a lot of contradictions in their own human rights report. North Korea draws continuously on history to justify its current, I guess you use the word entanglement, like its current difficulties. Um, so for instance, it makes the following types of claims. Um, North Korea is not able to economically provide for its people because they have to put those resources toward defending the country uh, against invasion from the United States. Um, well, I think many of us could say that if the United States wanted to invade North Korea, they could do it and they would have done it probably by now. Um, the North, uh, you know, so. Uh, and many defectors, if you ask them, will acknowledge that it is a, a kind of potent kim. It's actually not the way that North Korea really thinks. North Korea does not actually think that the United States wants to invade it. I mean, North Korea has, in fact, been quite provocative um, and has made many terrorist threats and acts toward other countries um, and has not received the same in return. So, but North Korea sets that up. Why do they set that up? And indeed, in the Korean War, there were mass atrocities committed throughout the Korean Peninsula uh, by the Americans and, of course, by the Soviet Union and the Chinese and the North Korean army as well. South Koreans working with the United States. Um, so that's absolutely the case. But to constantly evoke the past as a justification for difficulties in the present, um, it loses a bit of logic and a bit of consistency. So for instance, if we accept, as North Korea accept itself, accepts itself as a legitimate sovereign state, uh, responsible for its own actions, then to claim that North Korea is unable to provide for its people because it has to uh, fight the Americans or fight the threat of Americans um, is almost like suggesting that North Korea is not responsible for how it's treating its own people now. Um, that, you know, North Korea is not in charge of itself, if, if you follow, if you follow my logic. 
Yes, there's a inconsistency with um, sort of emphasizing state sovereignty and then denying your own responsibility for your people, right? Um, you know, who, who is responsible for the fact that North Korea had a famine? Is America really responsible for the fact that North Korea had a famine in the 1990s? Absolutely not. I mean, famine scholars show that we have early warning systems, that there's absolutely no reason why, in fact, any place in the world, there should be a famine. Now, if you want to talk about hunger, if you want to talk about malnutrition, those are different aspects. And of course, there are pockets of malnutrition and hunger in the United States. But there is no reason why a country should undergo famine in this day and age since the 1970s. And that's absolutely the case. We have early warning systems. North Korea knew if there was going to be a drought. They knew if there was going to be a flood. Um, you know, North Korea allowed that to happen. And they knew that they didn't have to, that, that allowing the famine to happen wouldn't be a risk to the government because a famine has never resulted in, you know, the overthrow of governments historically, never. So they knew it wasn't a threat. Um, can I um, take you back to, you had mentioned um, sort of some of the threats. You know, this isn't really necessary about your book, but you normally died in Japan. Um, what's the thing in Japan about the threat from North Korea? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. You know, uh, I've lived in Japan now six years and I feel I have greater and greater insights each day. <laughs> And I often felt this in South Korea too, that I had greater insights into North Korea, having lived in South Korea. And now I feel like I have greater insights into North Korea, having lived in Japan, especially there's so many aspects of North Korea that uh, are like Japan <laughs> in terms of the, the rigidity, the orderliness, the bureaucracy, um, the rule following. Um, but there are other things that are very distinctly uh, Korean in terms of the warmth. Um, and perhaps that's something I can talk about later because most people wouldn't associate North Korea with warmth, but that comes from doing work with North Korean defectors, you know, that there is warmth in the people anyway. Um, yes, the sense in Japan, of course, is, uh, you know, that North Korea is a threat. Um, largely, the human rights issue that they're concerned with is abduction. Uh, North Korea has abducted other nationalities as well, other nationals, excuse me, as well. Um, far more South Koreans have been abducted to North Korea. Uh, in fact, I think there are a few that were just abducted recently into North Korea from China and, uh, and many other nationals besides. Um, and of course, Japan is very concerned about the nuclear threat that North Korea poses. Uh, I think quite legitimately so, um, because Nor uh, Japan has its own experience, of course, with the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, there's a strong peace uh, atmosphere that surrounds the nuclear kind of, I don't know, what's the word I should use? The nuclear history has been really reframed in terms of a peace, you know, the response must be peace. Um, and then, of course, in terms of nuclear power in Japan, there's been uh, an intimate knowledge of the risk of what nuclear power, even North Korea, of course, says that they're building nuclear power, not nuclear weapons, but that... Um, the risk that that poses to society is also great too. So um, that's largely the sentiment in, in Japan. Less, I mean, less concern for political prison camps, et cetera, although uh, civil society groups do try to raise those issues. Thank you. Um, you, you talked about defectors a, a number of times. Um, you also talk in your book about uh, modes of population control, um, both domestic and international. How does the North Korean government seek to or, or actually um, control or counter criticism against these, you know, these criticisms from defectors. Mm -hmm. So one, so the first part of the book looks at crimes against humanity and there's a particular definition of crimes against humanity and the, the United Nations Commission of Inquiry published in 2014 did find that there were crimes against humanity happening in North Korea. And this basically means when there are deliberate human rights violations that are happening. For instance, rape, torture, uh, forced imprisonment, disappearment, disappearance, uh, enslavement, there are many. Um, and that this is part of a systematic campaign and that it's causing human suffering and death on a wide scale. So that was found to be the case in North Korea. The second part of the book looks at North Korea's denials. And in that regard, I did very close kind of forensic 
a video and linguistic analysis of North Korea's own state videos on North Korea's media, um, North Korean state representative speeches at the United Nations, at side events, uh, um, at the, um, uh, in the United States, various events. So, you know, North Korea has responded to the allegations of human rights violations or the findings of human rights violations by saying, look, you haven't been to the country. You've only spoken to people who have left. They are all, well, North Korea has a particular way of framing those people as rapists, murderers, child molesters, and they're obsessed with money. And they're painted as entirely black, yeah? There's no gray, um, and, which is a big sign that it's a totalitarian script. <laughs> uh, totalitarian loves a black and white script. And, um, you know, so what North Korea does is they try to give access. So North Korea started doing things post-2014, like having these side events at the United Nations, um, speaking, they had an ambassador speak in the United States. He took questions. This was very unprecedented. Uh, particularly, he took questions about the human rights issues. I really wish I was there to speak to him because I would have asked him about the human rights report, which North Korea wrote, which contains contradictions. And how is it possible? North Korea, for instance, in that human rights report said, that there were more people died because of sanctions which were uh, imposed on North Korea than did during the Korean War. It's simply not possible, you know, that that would be the case. So, for instance, um, North Korea then tries to give access. So they go, they go around the country and they are interviewing people and they're doing the kind of man on the street interview and they're asking, you know, what do you think about the human rights re report? And you can see that the individuals are basically parroting exactly the same formula that appears in North Korea's own print rhetoric. So I modeled it and you can see precisely that they are echoing it. So I call this in the book, an act of ventriloquism. You know, you have an individual who is in fact North Korean, who is in fact still in North Korea. And so this is quite precious to us to have the chance to hear an ordinary quote unquote North Korean speaking of course, they have obviously been selected. But what's interesting is that the voice that's put inside of them, well, it's still their voice. I mean, the voice is unique. It's quite uh, bespoke. But the words that they're speaking are absolutely scripted by the state. Um, and so this is kind of an opportunity, but also a risk in terms of human rights work. Um, I think it's something we should push a bit more for. So for instance, you could see uh, Will Ripley went to uh, North Korea and was interviewing overseas workers. And this issue of how does North Korea control uh, human rights. So if North Korean workers go overseas, it also sends the human rights violations over with them. So they can only access certain media, they can only go certain places, their wages are not given to them. Um, so it's almost like they export the environment of control with them. Well, Will Ripley went to Pyongyang and had a chance to meet these workers, allegedly, these overseas workers. And they told him exactly what we might expect to have heard that they were very happy to work overseas, that they were ha very happy to support the country, but they hadn't experienced any human rights violations and et cetera. So it would be very interesting for us to push and encourage Pyongyang to let us come and speak with ordinary North Koreans, for instance, who are freely available and uh, able to attend church, for instance. North Korea claims that they have freedom of religion. Um, let's ask North Korea if they would also let us come and interview people who are have different sexualities. Is North Korea um, how is North Korea in terms of homosexuality? Um, how is North Korea in terms of disability, different types of disability rights? Can we please speak to, can we have Will Ripley go in and please speak to some of these individuals as well? And then we could examine that and see, are they parroting exactly the same sorts of things that are coming out that we already know? Basically, could we write the script ourselves for them? <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. I, I'm looking at the time and I can't believe we're down to the last five minutes before Q&A and there's, there's so much to, well, that I, I would have liked to have gotten to. Um, but just, uh, I mean, maybe it was one of the last questions, um, one or two questions before we open up to Q&A. Um, you know, a lot, I think in the United States, there's a lot of sort of focus on before President Trump and now during President Trump. And so I wonder, how has U.S. policy toward North Korea changed with the start of the Trump administration? Um, if President Trump were to win re-election, do you foresee any new developments? Uh, I know, of course, there was those, those high-level meetings about um, you know, a formal peace. 
Uh, and if former Vice President Joe Biden were to win, do you foresee any appreciable changes? You know, uh, so I'm an anthropologist and we never, we rarely talk about this kind of future gazing stuff, but I find IR folks often, so I often feel like I have to pull out my crystal ball and say, well, let me see. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, it's a great question. And I appreciate it. Um, you know, Trump is, a, is an interesting man because <laughs> from what I see, many um, who are sympathetic to North Korea. So for instance, groups like uh, Women Across the DMZ, um, other communities in the United States, pockets here and there, are actually quite sympathetic to Trump because he's speaking to Kim Jong-un and uh, meeting with Kim Jong-un and trying to establish some sort of peace process, which I think is highly, highly questionable. Um, and I, I think somebody needs to do Kolo's forensic discourse analysis of how North Korea talks about peace and what they mean when they talk about peace. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, you know, and Trump's been kind of back and forth, like sometimes he's very hard on Kim Jong-un, but then other times he's very soft. Um, and then we know, well, I, I believe that Trump is very sympathetic, sympathetic to Putin, uh, and yet very critical of Xi Jinping, or at least China in the abstract. Um, so it's very difficult to know what would emerge with Trump. Trump, according to Woodward's Wood, new book, which I haven't had the chance to read yet, uh, I just saw some quotes that Trump was interested in pulling troops out of South Korea and is apparently very resentful of the presence of troops in South Korea. Well, I'm not in favor of Americans being present in other territories and this type of thing, but you know, if, if Trump were to pull troops out of South Korea, um, North Korea's raison d'etre is unification of the peninsula. So if he were to pull troops out, or, you know, recently I think Kim Jong-un has said, well, you know, I don't necessarily need the troops out, but I mean, as long as you don't do the military exercises, well, you're going to have a bunch of people that don't know how to do their job, <laughs> basically. And so you'd have, you know, um, you know you, you'd win quite well then in, in, in such a situation. So uh, for me, I, you know, I don't support Trump. Uh, I find him repugnant. I find his po politics completely racist and uh, unacceptable uh, to any thinking individual. But, uh, I, and I would be quite concerned if Trump were to be elected. Uh, at the same time, if Biden were to be elected, no matter who's elected, I think they need to be uh, very critically mindful and of any kind of peace rhetoric that comes out of North Korea. For instance, if North Korea is genuinely interested in having a peace agreement or a peace treaty or any kind of peace at all with the United States, um, North Korea needs to first begin to acknowledge um, the, the, the war that they are waging against their own people. Uh, and you know, within the Black Lives Matter movement, we talk about no justice, no peace. Um, North Korea has absolutely provided no justice to their people. and. Uh, and, and so I don't know how they could begin to talk about peace in that country. And the same thing is true in terms of South Korea. Uh, South Korea derogates many human rights violations of their own citizens, many of whom now are North Koreans who have uh, the status of South Koreans and um, you know, has to acknowledge, has to do an accounting. There has to be an accounting of the crimes that have been committed against their citizens on both sides. And to, uh, to begin to talk about a peace process that doesn't involve human rights, then, then it's not it's not about peace at all. It's just war under under the guise of peace. Thank you. Um, Annette uh, answered a question I had about essentially what is what would justice look like. Um, so that's good. Although, if any students want to ask more specific details on what a justice process might look like, you can do in the Q and A. Um, while I look at the Q and A for, for the first question, I'll just throw one more out at you, Sandra. Um, for students, faculty, and staff at the School of International Service, um, in addition to seeking greater access um, to what's happening in North Korea, what else might we be doing to um, support human rights in North Korea? And now I'm going to take a look at the questions while you answer that one. Sure, thank you. So for example, I wrote a piece. Um, it was incorporated slightly into the book. Um, I wrote it for the Journal of Health and Human Rights. And I talked about how, you know, there's different ways that we could encourage North Korea to see um, respect for human rights as something that is within their interest. So for instance, um, 
the spread of tuberculosis and multiple drug resistant tuberculosis is a big problem in North Korea. And uh, it's a problem that uh, is known to be uh, easily spread within prisons. And uh, North Korea has a whole system of political prison camps, as we know, um, re-education re centers as well. And they have guards who pass from within those centers to the rest of the population. So um, one thing we could do is let North Korea know, look, if you, um, you know, you could incorporate health measures for individuals within your prisons uh, that could improve their health at least. So about incrementally improving the rights of individuals within the country. And that's just one example of something we could do. Um, you know, I, again, if, if North Korea was genuinely interested in embracing peace or embracing human rights, now we're talking to each other on Zoom. Well, let's have more family unifications across the electronic uh, system and we don't need to worry about the divide. Why can't we do that? Why is it so difficult to do that? Of course, North Korea often operationalizes those things and doesn't want to do that. Um, so those are just two examples of things. Thank you. That also gets at uh, how the way Kim Jong-un is sort of embracing uh, technology, but also limiting um, its use for, for you know, human rights purposes. Um, That's fascinating too. Maybe, maybe we'll get to that. We have a, a couple questions. There's a couple from students in my class. So I'm gonna hold off on those since we have some of our own time with you coming up. Um, but one question is with Yoshidi, I'm going to say this incorrectly, I'm sure, with Yoshidi Suga set to become Japan's next prime minister, mm -hmm. how do you think Japanese North Korean relations will shift? You know, I don't know a lot about Suga, but um, the bit that I've read is that he, and, and I'm happy to be, like, listen, if someone wants to put something in the comments to, to educate me further, I'm happy to hear that. Um, you know, that he's highly conservative, that he's kind of like Abe, but a little bit worse maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so in terms of the status of non-Japanese in Japan, you know, ethnic Koreans in Japan, uh, Chinese in Japan, all of that, a little bit of concern. And of course, for the status of, uh, you know, Chongnyeon, the ethnic North Korean population in Japan, um, that's also uh, concerning. Um, perhaps he will take a harder line. I, I don't know if I could really answer that question. But of course, I would be sympathetic to him pressing for a human rights issue that not only incorporates the, the abduction issue, but goes much further. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is, what was a testimony from a North Korean defector that really stuck out to you? Well, it was, oh God, so many. Um, I have to say, and perhaps with your students, we'll be able to speak about this further. You know, when I was a young PhD student doing the work, I, I think what stood out to me the most was the kind of haunting experience that happened from listening to so many of the testimonies over and over and over. And I um, began to dream them. I would go to sleep and it's like anybody who's worked, I mean, I've worked many menial jobs in my life and, you know, you dream that you're at the coffee shop, you dream that you're at the sandwich shop, and I would dream that I was within the tales that North Koreans were telling me. And uh, that was quite disturbing. But perhaps one of the stories that stands out for me the most is um, a man who told me about his son dying in his arms, and he just showed me the place where his son had died. He held out his arms, empty, of course. And it's just, you know, that didn't have to happen. That didn't have to happen. You know, he was then sitting in South Korea in a country with young men who were the age his son would have been if his son had only been born south of the 38th parallel. You know, those sorts of things. And then to be doing that work in South Korea, walking among this ethnicity who are brethren, as they say, to those in the North who are suffering so brutally, that was another thing that was, that was quite difficult. Thank you. I, uh, I mean, it raises another question that uh, if we have time, we can come back to. Um, you know, of course, the book is about the suffering of, of, of North Korean people. Um, but as a researcher, there are um, mental health uh, risks that are associated with this kind of research. So um, maybe we can um, come back to that uh, mm -hmm. if we have time here. Um, 
I'm going to skip one question and get back to it because there's another question about defectors. Uh, when having discussions with North, North Korean defectors, did the topic of the black market come up in terms of access to technology and information? If so, what was generally what you heard about this? So, yes, the black market was how most people got by. It was how most it is how most people get by. It's how most people get information. Um, it's a lifeline. Um, What's interesting about the foreign information, access to foreign information, of course, any of you who've watched North Korean news, um, there's a really interesting YouTube channel now. I think it's called Echo. I think it used to be called Truth or something, which is, uh, <laughs> anyway, but uh, Echo is a very interesting name for it and uh, pretends to be a blogger in Pyongyang. Um, anyway, look, if you watch North Korean news, if you read North Korean news, you know it's quite repetitive and a kind of a bit boring, but also it can be interesting intellectually. But for North Koreans in the black market to have access to South Korean media, North uh, to have access to Japanese, Chinese, American, I mean, it's fascinating. And of course, many of you who've watched South Korean dramas know the plots are riveting. You know, I mean, talk about TV addiction, you just need to keep watching. So um, this is very enticing for them. There's an interesting study, however, related to this aspect of foreign information by Nat Kretchen and Jane Kim. Um, I can't remember the title of it's fading right now in the moment, but any, it's referenced in the book. But they say that the studies have shown that North Koreans who have access to foreign media, that those North Koreans, their perception of other countries has changed. So their perception of Japan, China, South Korea, the United States has changed. Um, but the perception of their own government hasn't changed. So this is concerning because, um, you know, for, for many North Koreans to see the, the role or the accountability of their government in their lives, you know, in how malnourished they are, in how unhealthy they are, in how politically disenfranchised they are, in how imprisoned they are, uh, it's very difficult for them to make those connections. And uh, I think that's something that we need to weave together. Okay, thank you. There's a, a number of questions that are now coming back to other things we talked about, so hopefully we'll, we'll get to them. Um, uh, next question we have is, Pyongyang often enjoys many economic liberties that the rest of the countryside does not, uh, whether you know, pizza shops um, or underground wedding dress shops and the elites have, that elites have connections to. How do the people of the North Korean countryside see the Pyongyang citizens in comparison to their own countryside culture? Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes back to what I discovered in the research for my first book. You know, so I was asking the North Korean defectors when, when you were back inside North Korea and you know you saw what was going on, in terms of like linguistic analysis. One of the questions I asked North Korea Koreans was, "How did you speak to yourself?" You know, self-talk is something a lot of us do, and um, I said, "How did you speak to yourself about the inequalities that you saw?" And so, for instance you know, seeing someone who was boibu, secret police, um, security police, eating better than you, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's, you know, one of the ways that I was able to access the humor that was mentioned in North Korea. Um, but a lot of the times it's attributed to just, this is just the way it is. My sangbun, my low ingredient, sangbun relates to kind of a political ingredient, like your, your DNA has scripted your political inheritance. So if you have any connection with South Korea, if you have any connection with Japan, if you returned from Japan, if you're ethnically green, you returned from Japan to the North, Tessa, Tessa Moore Suzuki has written a lot about this, excellent scholar, um, then you have a uh, kind of sangbun that's questionable, meaning your political loyalty is questionable. So you know, Yunmi Park writes about this, all, all the defectors, you know, know of it, they may not have known what their own sangbun was, but they know of sangbun, you know, they know that there are these rankings and there is this awareness that in Pyongyang um, things are better, but how much better uh, is something that I think a lot of North Koreans can't really appreciate. You know, we talk about us in the West not knowing about North Korea, but often in North Korea itself, North Koreans don't often understand unless they've been able to travel so for instance, some within media are able to do this, some within the military have done this. Um, then they get an, a sense of how 
unequal the country is. Um, the people up in Chongjin don't, don't necessarily know how much better things are in Pyongyang. They're not watching, for instance, the videos by Echo, um, Una, I'm failing to remember the name of the channel. Thank you. Um, so we do have a follow-up question related to um, mental health risks. Um, and the question is, how did you prevent yourself from, from burnout that is common among crisis workers and trauma researchers? Well, I don't know that I did. <laughs> so don't do what I did. Um, well, you know, it's funny because in the book, and you'll see this in this book. So I was talking with a friend of mine who I've worked with since, gosh, probably since 2003, I think, in South Korean, North Korean man, North Korean factor. And, uh, you know, I was just saying to him, you know, it's so depressing. It's really hard to, to do this work. And he, he just kind of laughed at me. He said, Sandra, <laughs> Sandra, <laughs> you know, that you just have to research this. That was our life. And in some ways, it's sort of mean and dismissive. Um, you know, he's not a counselor. He's not a psychologist. He's not a psychotherapist. You know, he's a defector. And uh, so, you know, for me to tell him that I find it depressing is, well, you know, that's the audience that I'm speaking to. Um, so it is incredibly difficult. Luckily for me, I had a wonderful um, PhD supervisor, I had two wonderful PhD supervisors, Keith Howard and Johan Potier at SOAS. Um, both of them are no longer there, they uh, both retired, who were incredibly supportive. Um, Keith Howard had done work with um, the Comfort Women and uh, Johan Potier had done work with, um, uh, um, with famine survivors as well in parts of Africa. So, you know, they knew they were very compassionate and understanding to me. And so um, that was something I was able to speak to them about. And I don't know if it can be prevented actually, to be honest, I think um, you have to know what your own personality and your own character can handle. And then, you know, um, get a therapist, <laughs> get a therapist and, uh, you know, and, and process it and talk to people about it. Thank you, Sandra. It's, a, it's important bet to balance um, you don't want to be a desensitized researcher, right? But you also don't want to um, suffer too much uh, of the mental health, this, you know, trauma associated with doing this kind of research. So, um, I mean, if I may, I just want to say, yeah. Jeff, I think one of the things that's very important for us to remember is always to come back to the present. And for me, anyway, to recognize how incredibly grateful I am and privileged as a human being um, and th that I need to work on behalf of, of, of others. And that helps me to kind of to, to lift out of, of the grief, of the awareness of other people's lives and into action. Thank you, yeah. Um, so uh, maybe we have one more here um, and it goes back to, you know, you, you mentioned how um, North Koreans, their opinions have shifted on their views of other countries, but not necessarily um, responsibly their own government for, um, you know, the issues they're confronted with. And the question is, you know, um, the question was, do North Koreans believe the propaganda? And maybe a different way to, would, uh, to put this is, why do they believe the propaganda? Mm -hmm. Well, what I think, if someone who's asking that question, what I would like them to do, anybody who wonders that, what I would like, well, perhaps you need to take a buddy with what I'm about yet to ask you to do. But what, what I would ask you to do is to spend a, a considerable amount of time each day reading North Korean news and listening to North Korean news. Um, if you can't do it in Korean, then do it in English and do it a lot. And uh, when you originally start reading North Korean news, it seems so bad. You can't believe that anyone would go for this. But you have to remember no living North Korean who is present in North Korea has ever experienced a media made freely by North Koreans. They haven't. They've experienced media, if they're lucky, from South Koreans, from Americans, from Japanese, from Chinese, whatever, but they have never seen their own selves freely represented, you know, the kind of for us, by us. They've never had that. So, you know, read the media begins to get seductive, it drones on. I remember when I was doing this, the research for this um, book with my young, amazing research assistant, um, um, Yanji Kim, 
<laughs> at one point she came to me she was like Sandra you know I wonder if it kind of do you think maybe <laughs> because I mean basically we were drinking the Kool-Aid so um it has a very hypnotic effect. And, and for instance, let me take this idea that North Korea uses a lot of whataboutism. I mean, the Soviet Union did a lot of this, Russia, it's very popular nowadays, whataboutism. You know, so North Korea used that, that hypocrisy, the appeal to hypocrisy, you know, they didn't provide any details about the human rights report. The allegations that were made about North Korea, North Korea never published anything about those. North Korea never told any of its population how big the human rights report was. You know, it was almost 400 pages long. They interviewed more than 200 people. They combed through tons of documents. But if you read North Korean media, you'd only think it was a couple pages long. You think they interviewed maybe five people. And every single person who they interviewed was a rapist, a child molester, you know, a thief being paid by the American government. So those don't sound like reputable sources to me. And uh, North Korea doesn't give human rights to anybody, let alone, you know, somebody who's a rapist which, you know, in a democracy, when you have rule of law, even if someone breaks it, you still protect their human rights. So, so for North Koreans, and when they encounter this kind of whataboutism argument, whataboutism, I think somebody needs to do a study on this, but I'm quite convinced that the only type of argument, if we can call it that in quotations, that exists in North Korea is this kind of too coquet, this appeal to hypocrisy, this whataboutism, which actually never advances the argument, it just changes the subject. Thank you, Sandra. Um, well, our, our time is up here. Uh, so thank you for your time and for participating in this event.